So today we are going to look at a simple use case where we are trying to building, build an order management system. So the, the motivation of this particular use case is <coughs> right. so somebody accept order, so the order is already accepted. So, and now we have to do the shipment. And if there's any issue with the shipment, like if the shipment was delayed, if the shipment was successful, we have to send notification and inform people about how it happened. Or if there's a delay, we have to predict when you can send that shipment. And then at the same time, you also want to run some analytics on like how many orders have received, how many shipments have you have shipped, so on and so forth. So that is uh, some stuff. So, so in this particular use case, so there are lots of subparts. Like, uh, so you have to first accept orders. You have to enrich the order with shipment information. Like, when an order comes from a particular user, or you have to send, you have to find out where you want to send that information, and then you have to actually make the shipment. Shipment, but yeah, when that happens, sometimes you will go out of stock or, or things like that. At that time, you have to re. You have to retry that shipment after some time because you currently, for certain reasons, you can't do it at this point. Then you have to also send notifications, like so on upon, upon successful shipment. You have to inform your customer that your shipment is successful. Uh, on delays, you have to tell, okay, when can you basically do the shipment? Okay, so that's also an important part of it. And allows users to also modify their um, notifications. Like I want to change, I want to get a notification if somebody send a shipment to this stuff. So there may be some staff or there may be some administrators who want to change the notification behavior. Then we have to also be able to analyze orders and shipments by the shipment status, shipment by region, orders over time. So it's quite a lot of stuff here. So let's see how we can implement that. So. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the backend implementation. So this is using the WSO2 stream processor. Um, so Nuan will come back after me and talk about how you can do API management on top of it, and how you can product this, monetize this, and analyze the whole stuff on top of this backend. So this is the backend that we are going to build. So first, there is this client who is sending an HTTP request as when the order is accepted. So we basically receive those messages. And for all the messages that we receive, we have to enrich that information. Like we have to enrich based on the user, okay, to whom we need to send the, send the shipment, right? So then we basically call the shipment service and do the shipment. So that is all that we, on the business side, that's all we have to do. But when you do that, that, that can become a successful shipment or it can be a failure from the shipment department. They, they might say, okay, I can't accept it right now. Send me sometimes afterwards. So if that happens, then we have to basically see if it is a successful shipment, we have to send an email alert, a notification, right? So that's the happy part, okay? At the meantime, we have to also uh, store this information so that we can analyze that. So you are sorting into a, da a database, you are showing it in a dashboard, and then we are also exposing this information through a REST API such as the systems can basically understand how, how, how it is behaving, how many shipments are pending to be delivered, how many have been already delivered, and all of those information you can pass it through API Manager to external clients. At the same time, we can also write your own custom rules so that you can basically get different notification based on, on different conditions. Okay, so all of this shipment information is also stored into a shipment info DB. Right, so this database is used such that if, if there are failure shipments, then we can, we as a trigger, like we periodically check this database. If there are failures, we fetch them back and we send it through the, again, the same pipeline. Right, so if there's a failure, then you retry it after some time. So this is the failure processing part of that. Okay, so now this is the shipment happens. If there's a failure, we try to retry that periodically. If the second time it fails, it comes back to the database and we try it even faster, so it will be an infinite retries. Uh, and uh, we have analytics on that, we have custom notifications on this. And okay, if there is a failure, so we have to detect delays. So what we basically do is, when we receive a message, we basically wait for a certain period of time. Okay, the order is received, have we done a successful shipment? If a successful shipment came at that, within a period of time, 
Okay, then it's fine. Okay, we got, got, the, got the request and we have shipped the items. But if there is a delay in this, uh, on that, and if he didn't receive a successful shipment, then we basically identify, okay, there is a delay in, in, in processing the message. So then we, but basically what we do is we use a machine learning model and, I, and try to predict how much time it might take and then inform the user saying, okay, unfortunately we can't ship your item right now. You might be getting the item in X number of days. Uh, of some polite way of saying that we can't do it right now, right? So if you want to do a prediction, then you have to also learn, right? So you have to know the system and, and learn on real time how you can improve your, uh, the prediction rate. So to do that, you have, we have another piece of component where we receive the shipment, and when the successful shipment information come, eventually, we try to see, okay, at this point of time, at this, for this particular customer or this particular region, this much time it has taken to deliver this shipment at this day, day of the, time of the day, right? So that will feed into as a training part. So here we are learn, training the model on real time, we are doing predictions on the real time, and then we are doing the whole stuff. So this is the overall use case that on the backhand side that you are, I'm going to demonstrate to you with the WSO2 stream processor. Okay, so, um, so what the challenges that we f usually face when you try to build this stuff is you have to write a lot of complex code, you have to have a very complex deployment, and the changing of your code is very fast. So uh, I think you all know about WSO2 stream processor, which hand, you can do streaming analytics, streaming data integration, so that's other use cases that we are trying to sh uh, demonstrate here as well. Uh, and in this, uh, so we are going to show you its capabilities of streaming SQL, graphical editor, the citizen integration. And I'm not going to go into this multiple deployment option, but is, there is one way that you can deploy this application uh, and run. OK. So before I start, the WSO2 stream process have multiple uh, uh, sub-components into it. So one, if the, one of it is editor and the studio, which you do the development environment. So I will try to show you that experience of using that. And then you have a worker, which is actually the node that runs this logic. Okay. And then we also have a dashboard where we can do some uh, visualization. We can do citizens integration. We can, do, uh, we can monitor the whole system. And at the same time, you also have a job manager, which if you want to do it, that is only used if you are doing a distributed deployment. So the normal use cases, you really don't need that. So this is only if you want visualization. Editor is only for the development environment, and you just need the worker to run it on production. Right? So that's how it works. So let's start uh, the use case. Right? So I'm not going to go into the details of the product, so I'll try to open the stream processor and show you how it works. <laughs> OK. So what I have done is I have, so I have a WSO2 stream processor, 430. I have just unzipped that. Uh, and then within the 430, if you can go into this particular uh, structure, we, we have a component called W. Uh, we, have a, we have a configuration directory. Within the configuration directory, we have worker, manager, all of these profiles. If you go to worker, there is this particular file called deployment.yml file. So this is the only file that you have to edit on WSO2 stream process. And we have reduced, this is built using the latest C5 technology. So this is the only file that you need to edit if you really want to do any modification at all. So for example, if you want to put any email related configuration, I have, I have created an email configuration here uh, to send an email alert. Uh, and then I have also created a demo database so that I can use, I'm using an H2 database to store some, in this, all the in-memory stuff are stored in this particular database configuration. So these are the only two configurations that I have done. All the other informations are default stuff, so if you want to do analytics for API manager and all other stuff, so these are, they are by default, so you really don't need to touch them. And I have also enabled uh, to do monitoring on this application. So there's also a configuration that you have to change it to true. I have made it enable to run that. So those are the changes that I have done. So, so that is on in terms of the configuration side. So let's try to start the editor. So let's I go to bin and 
editor.sh. So now we are starting the editor environment. So it is, it is something like a developer studio where you can basically uh, do your processing. So you can find uh, the editor runtime here. So I'm just opening it up. So it gives you uh, a way of, uh, so it gives you some samples that you can write. You can click on it. It also gives you how, how to set up that sample, how to run it, that, uh, and all of those cases. You, can, you also have a, you can save this sample. And you can also do a visualization of this uh, scenario. Like you can also have different flows. Like for example, I want to build uh, build another stream called a foo stream, which having an attribute of price, uh, and maybe uh, um, you know amount or, or, or something like that, right? So uh, I don't need this. Uh, so I have created a stream here. Then for this particular stream, if I want to associate an input. Right, so here I'm going to get a message. OK, where am I going to get this message from? So I'm going to get it from an HTTP message. Right? So, and OK, what is the receiver URL? So this is the default URL that it suggested. So maybe I can use 8006. And maybe I'm say, so all, let's say a different number, 8008 orders. So this is the URL that I want to receive the messages. OK, how, what kind of message that you are going to receive? OK, I'm going to receive a JSON message. OK, what, if, it's a cluster, if it is a clustered JSON, uh, how, how do you find that? If, if, it, if the JSON is malformed, whether you want to drop it or you want to continue it. So those kind of information that you can additionally add. And you can also give custom mapping, like, OK, if, if it is a price, how do you want to map it? If you want an amount, how you want to extract that values from the JSON, you can give those information. So, so this is uh, this is a simple case. And now, okay, if I want to write the output back, right? So I, 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 here I might want to. How, how am I going to send this output to others? I can send an email, or I'm just going to log it here. So I'm just going to say I want to lock the message and submit that. So if I go to my source view again, so what I have written now is uh, this full stream, right? So you can see. So this is what's happening here. So I have a source reading from HTTP from a particular URL, and then I have a sync which I write it out. Right? So this is a very simple way that you write it. You can, if you really want, that we can also do this uh, uh, on, on this case. Like say I can say, um, so if I want to write a query, so I can say from foo, and if this uh, price is greater than uh, 100, I want to insert into, insert into bar, right? So this is a simple query that I have written, right? So this I'm, I want to basically do it, or maybe I can, so it says there's an error. So let's say why there's an error. Uh, the string cannot be used in greater than comparison. So apparently my amount is a string, so I can't use it. So it also do this automatic stuff, so maybe, okay, I'll make this into a long. Right. So now the errors goes away. So it, it, it basically gets you to develop everything. Uh, OK, now what's the problem again? Oh, sorry. <laughs> OK, let's make it double. OK. So, so this is a very simple use case of that. So if I want to test this stuff, OK, maybe I can, um, I can go back to this design view. Uh, so now I have this query the bar. So I want to put a log for that. So I can maybe you know, put another sync. I can join that. And I basically say, OK, I want to create another log out of it. So, so you, it's based on your implementation. You can basically do it any way you want. So I'm going back to the source view. So there's a log for this bar stream Okay, that automatically comes in. You can also reformat the code. It helps you to do that. So I have saved this. Now I have to test it and see before I put it to the production, right? So how you do, do that? You just start it. So the system is started up and running. I can simulate an event to this. So my app is called receive and count event. And I have this stream called foo stream. 
and I'm going to put a price of 100, or maybe like just put 10, and amount of, I don't know, like 100. If I send a message, so now I'm, what am I doing here is I'm basically injecting my message into this foo stream. I'm bypassing this. I'm injecting into foo stream. So you can basically see I'm receiving and counting the foo. I'm getting a log here, but there is no log printed for the bar because of this condition that we have written, the message is not going through. So if the price is greater than 100, so let's make it 1,000, and we send a message. Now you should be able to see two messages, OK? Uh, you know, I am now also receiving a message in the bar saying the 1,000 has come, right? So, so you can basically do some sort of testing here to validate whether the whole stuff is working. If you are happy, then you, you basically you, you stop it, you export that, and you put it to production. So this is just to show you the developer experience of how you basically build this application. So let's see how you can basically do that particular scenario that we are trying to do on, 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 on the stream processor. So, we ha so what I have done is I have uh, put some <coughs> uh, effort and implemented the whole stuff uh, here. So first of all, it is order management, right? So uh, which is called the order management in the application. So what I have here is accept orders. So this accept orders basically get the messages from this particular URL uh, uh, on a JSON message, OK? Uh, so it, um, and it basically accepts the orders through that. So when you have the accept orders, what we basically do that is I'm first of all, I'm enriching that information with the user information, right? So I have accept orders. I'm joining with this table called user info table that has information like ID, username, location, address, and email ID. And I'm basically enriching this whole information. So now I have where I know where to send this order. Right? So I have basically enriched that information. So after enriching that information, I'm going to use that accept order information stream, the same stream I'm exporting here. Right? And I'm calling this service called the shipment service. So I'm now pushing this message out to the shipment service. The shipment service is received written here. So we have the shipment service. It is going to do an HTTP POST request to another service that is existing, and it is sending a JSON post message, right? And it has this thing called, thing called sync ID, so where we can bind this shipment service to this shipment response. So this sync ID is similar to the sync ID, so you will get the response here. And when the response comes, you can get the original message properties like order IDs, user IDs, stuff. Uh, or else you can also get some attributes from the message that is you are receiving back. And I am basically creating this other stream called shipment service response. Right? So I'm doing a call, I'm getting a response, and this is what I have as a response. So what I basically do with that is this shipment service response, I, because the amount comes as a string, I own, I'm converting that into a long. And I'm basically updating this shipment information table, right? So I'm basically updating it, saying, OK, uh, the, so I'm doing an update or insert to this table. So this shipment information table, like it is also defined here, uh, where do you find that? The shipment information table, it has a primary key of order ID. So all of this order is, is, is a primary key, so you can't insert two of that. And it is backed by an RDBMS database, right? So you can also give the database credential, the URL, and everything in line. But here, what I have done is I have basically used, I have configured in the backend, and I have given the data source name here. So this is, this is what I have actually configured uh, somewhere here. So if you find demo. This is what I have configured here, so the demo DB. So it will basically use these database credentials and use my H2 database. You can use any database you want. Uh, so that's how it works. Right. So <coughs> I have this, uh, I'm basically inserting into the shipment information table. Right. So let's see if I can visualize this data. So it will be a quite a big one. Right. So we have this HTTP request coming in, the orders, we are enriching this data. 
We are accepting this in order. We are calling this shipment service. Okay, that is calling through HTTP request. We are getting an HTTP response. We are getting a shipment response from that. And that particular shipment response, I am doing some small processing here, and I am storing into this DB. So this is what I was explaining so far. And what I want to do next is I wanted to identify the successful shipment information, right? And I wanted to basically send an email out of it, right? So let's say, let's say how I basically do that part, right? So when, when this uh, message was there, um, uh, so this is coming from the service response. So, so in the service response, I want to filter out if the status is successful, that means we have done the shipment, okay? I want to basically notify the stream. So this is the notification procedure. So in the notification, I have an email reference created. So that has all my email ID and everything, independent of this application. So if you want to move this from a dev to prod to different environments, you can just use that, because that uh, email-related username of using that and email data configurations are in the back end on, on the server side. Uh, so what you want to add here is, you, is the subject uh, to where you want to send this message uh, and the content type. And here I am using. Uh, uh, a, a text HTML content type, and I'm writing a message, right? In this message, you can see I'm using this double curly braces and filling some value in, right? So for example, I have this order ID, username, location, amount, email, address, and date coming into this. And from that, I'm, use, I'm using that to build this particular email, right? So this high username would be the actual username who will be accessing this message, right? So. So let's give it a try whether this works, right? So um, uh, let's see what are the things I have missed on this part. So uh, uh, the other thing that I have missed is the retrying logic. So if you want to retry this stuff every now and then, then you can basically define a trigger. So we define a trigger and process every 10 seconds, OK? That is going to do a simple thing. It basically, the trigger stream will join with the shipment information, get all the delayed messages, OK? And it basically, it, in this particular case, I have to again join with the user info table to get some more information. And I'm basically calling the shipment service. The whole process continuous, continuously happen every 10 seconds, right? So, so that's all about it. I, have, um, uh, I can write this external shipment service in any other language. Like, you can use Ballerina, you can use an EI. Um, so, but what I, since I just wanted to use the same product to make it much easier for me to do the de uh, for the do the demo, I have actually created the shipment service inside with the CD app itself. But here, what basically happens is you get the request, you do some processing, and you send the response in a synchronous way, right? So I'm not doing anything fishy here. So if the order ID is greater than uh, Thousand, uh, I'm going to say it's 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 uh, if it's greater than thousand, I'm going to delay the messages. If it is less than thousand, I'm going to uh, uh, send it. Uh, okay, so I'm just writing a small logic so that sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't happen. So there's this if then else statements. You can do math uh, round. You can use uh, random variable. You can round it. So all of these extensions are working it, and you can find you know more information about that and how to use it on this uh, on this editor. OK, so let's see. So this service is started. Uh, and I, I, I rather not recommend you to write services like this. This, is, this stream processor is not meant to be write services. This is just for uh, these demo purposes. You can write, use any other languages to create a service. But this is just for a demonstration purpose. OK, so now I have this order management service. It is started and running. Uh, and you can see this. Now I'm, I'm expecting the messages to come from this particular URL. Uh, and I have to send a message to that, right? So let's see how I can do that. So, so this is a curl command. Uh, I have some information on that. Uh, so let's I'll open a new tab. So I'm sending a curl command to these orders um, with uh, this particular ID, and I'm sending it out, right? So the message went. Right. 
So you can see the logs in both here or here. So you can see some, some stuff happening here. So there's a shipment response have, have come. And apparently, it says delayed. right? Since it is delayed, uh, it has retried uh, after some time. Again, it is delayed. Then it is retrying after uh, probably 10 seconds. And at that point, it has become a success. Right? So, uh, and so it has failed two times. And when you retry it again, it has become successful. So I have also configured an email to go out. Let's see whether the email is there. OK. The order shipped email has come. So you can see zero minutes ago. So, I, so this is the message that comes in. Hi, hi Peter, your ID this with 100,000 items have been shipped to this particular address uh, that you want. So, so, so now we have been automatically generating this stuff. So let's try to do uh, the, the second part of it, which is, uh, um, uh, which is the prediction scenario. I try to, try, try to show you that use case as well. Uh, so, so this is the delayed shipment stuff. So here also it has similar use, similar uh, scenario. So we get these accepted orders, right? So we basically do some processing to identify, detect the delay, and you, we do some processing to calculate the delay, right? And from that we try, we train the data, we do some prediction, and we send an email, right? So that is what we are going to do as the, as a whole. So let's see the. I'll only talk about some interesting things that you might not learn from the other stuff. So how we, would, how we calculate the delay here, right? So when we get the orders, we get the current time in millis. So we have the system time in milliseconds, right? Uh, I'm enriched this stream with that information. So here, for every event of accepted order followed by the notification, which is E2, of the same order ID, then I can basically get the current time and the E1 dot time, that is the E first accepted order's time. Then I can basically find out the delay. So I'm trying to get in the delay in seconds in this particular case. right? So this is the delay, identifying the delay between two stuff. And I'm going to use this for training purposes. right? Uh, and if I want to train the messages, I'm, I'm using a streaming machine learning algorithm called AM Rules Regressor, which is one of a famous uh, uh, algorithm that you can find out. So I'm going to pass the amount and the delay period for the training. I'm just using those two as of now. right? So I ha I'm using this model one as a reference for that. And at the same time, I have this accepted orders also coming in. right? And if there is no notification happening for 30 seconds, OK, if there's no notification for 30 seconds, then I'm going to say that as a delayed shipment. right? So I am having this. I have another pattern saying, OK, there's no notifications for 30 seconds, and it is going to be a delay. If it is delayed, then I'm going to use that delay stuff, pass that into the, the, the same algorithm, and I'm, now I'm trying to do the prediction part, right? So this is update uh, AM, uh, this stuff. And here we are just using that. So we are using it for prediction. We are passing the amount. So it will give you the prediction in long. So it will give you the prediction delay. So the prediction comes in uh, uh, double. So I'm converting it to long here. So then I basically have the delayed shipment notification. So I can send the notification out. Right, so that's I have another email message written to say the notification. Right, so uh, let's write. Uh, so let's try that one as well. And before doing that, I'll also show you another one, which is the analytics part of it. So now we have the orders coming in. So what I want to do with that is I want to calculate analytics. I want to analyze that from seconds to year. Right. I want to get the order, user ID, username, location. I want to count the orders, and I want to take a sum of items that have been ordered, Group the, grouping them by user ID and location. I want to calculate for every second to year. Right? So this is, this is that histogram that you want to create. Right? So I have written everything in once. So this is also going to do, do use this uh, database 
It's going to create different tables inside. Sometimes it uses database. Sometimes it uses in-memory. It does a, it's a combination of that, right? Uh, so now you have all this information. Uh, so I'm also, I'll also run this part. So all of, all of them are running, and I'm going to send a message again. So this particular message, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send an ID which is quite high, or more than 1,000, so the system, that particular service will fail this for five times, and then it will allow you to go. So that is done like that. So for the ID that I was passing, this is 1689. So you can see it is delayed. It is delayed again. So <coughs> it would delay for us for about, for about five, six times. So, um, so it is delayed again. So it has been continuously delayed. And when 30 seconds has passed, we should get this detection of uh, 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 um, like saying like we have uh, this, uh, this error condition occurred, so we have to do a prediction and we have to send that information out. Um, so well, let's and now eventually it has succeeded. Uh, so let's see what I have got on my email. So there are two messages. The first message saying, okay, your order is delayed, and it says the order is delayed, and it says approximately it takes zero seconds, because this is the first message I'm sending. The system is not trained, so it says zero seconds, right? Uh, but after this, if it becomes success, now the successful message has also gone to the client, right? I'm using all, everything is in the same email. Don't worry about it. Let's see that we have to train this, right? So we have to train it. So I will artificially train this for some time and do it. So in the simulation world, you can also do a feed simulation. Like you can go and create a feed simulation. You can can be random numbers. It can be a CSV file. It can from a database. So if it is from a CSV file, I'm saying okay, uh, delayed shipment notification is what I want to send. I want to simulate to this delayed train stream, uh, and the, and I have already uploaded this particular file. So otherwise, you can click upload and upload that particular file here, and I am going to save that. So that will be a feed simulation that is saved, and I can just play. So now, this is like, rather than sending one event by event, I have a CSV file of a lot of events, and I'm basically simulating these messages uh, uh, to that. Right? So, so that is what is basically happening here. So if I want to show you the file, <coughs> so the file I'm using for training is, is this particular CSV file, which has some, some values and some stuff. And it's, it's, it's a very simple CSV file that I'm using here. Uh, so, so this is the two values that I'm, I'm feeding in. So let's try to send another message and see like how, how the prediction is as of now, right? So let's put a different ID. Uh, and I also try to change the use ID here. Right, so you kind of get the same kind of behavior. So now this is a different user, so it's called John, and it's, it's, it's getting delayed for four times. Uh, it's about time to get the notifications. It says shipment is delayed, and it's, it's approximately predicting a time, right? So now we have, since we have trained it, uh, so, uh, so that actual delay would depend on the accuracy of the training, so, and you will have to eventually get the other notification as well. Right, so now we have all these messages being collected. So, so there can be a use case uh, 
Um, so I have about another seven minutes more. So I have, we have, so there can be a use case where the business user want to do these changes. Like we don't want uh, everybody, uh, everyone to uh, do these changes by themselves. Like if we want to do that, then what we have to basically do is there is a scenario called um, template editor. So the editor is started on this, and there's another co thing called template editor. So I can. I have already created a, a, a templated file so that I can use it in this particular demo. So, so this is an order management stuff. Uh, I have a name and a description for that, and I have multiple rules defined on this. So this is a template. Uh, I have some descriptions. Uh, how many times this can be applied, just once or many times. OK, what is the SID, the application that you want to create? Right? So, so what basically happens here is I have copy-pasted a SID, the application that has already been implemented. And what I have done here is, you know this amount? I'm not sure whether you can see. So, so there are some fields like this amount and the location and the email ID is parameterized, right? So I'm, I, have, I have made them a parameterized values, right? So when that is parameterized, now what you can basically do is we can also allow scripts to be written. Like, for example, if the input is less than 0, I want to throw an error. So I want to do some validation, right? Uh, and if the, if the email ID is not in a proper format, I want to throw an error as well. So you can basically do some validation for that input. And then you can basically ask users to fill certain stuff. So I can say you can, for the location, there's a drop down with these values. Uh, for the input for email, I, uh, the default value of the items to order is this. And default email that you want to send is this. Like, so you can basically give some default values. So you can export this, and there's a folder that you have to copy paste this. And when you do that, you can basically start this one uh, in the dashboard. So, so I'm going to skip where to copy those stuff, because it's, it, it's, it's a file that you have to copy and start. Uh, and then at the meantime, I'm also going to start the worker, because this is why where the data will be copied. So in the, in the dashboard, there are multiple things like profiles, business rules, and stuff. So business rules is what we are going to look at right now. So I log in that. So I can basically go here and, and create a rule that I wanted to. Like, so I can say a rule called foo if a message coming from Paris with amount, you know, 2000 or whatever number I want to send an email to this email ID. I can say I can save and deploy. So when you do this, this rule will be deployed on the worker that we are going to run. So you can see that is particularly deployed. So if you want to monitor the workers or whether they are they are running as expected, we also have a monitoring application that basically helps. Uh, identif gives you the load average, CPU statistics, uh, some sort of information. And if you have uh, some thing running, so you can see you know, the amount has been updated, uh, the item has been changed to Paris, and the email ID is what I have given there. Right? So I can, the business user, if they want, they can go back here, edit this, and I want to change this to London, and, and maybe change the values to you know, some other value. Okay? They can save and deploy it again. Right? So when that automatically done, in the status dashboard, it also get the automatically updated. Right? So you really don't need to ask your business users to write all the queries, and you can give a citizens integrate a kind of an experience for your business user by doing some small extra steps. So that is with this particular part. Uh, and this will help you to give, get information about your throughput of your application uh, and all of those, info, um, all of those stuff. Uh, uh, in this particular dashboard. And you can also see uh, uh, 
see a view of it, um, and I have not enabled all the matrices to show, show them. Uh, at the meantime, I we also have something called the dashboard portal if you want to build an analytics on top of it, right? So we have admin. So what I have done is created a simple dashboard that will <coughs> fetch the data from, uh, uh, from, from different uh, profiles and, and show it to you here. So you can see over time uh, how, the, how the location uh, and orders have been made, right? So, so you can basically see that here. Uh, items ordered over time, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And you can also get different granularity. So I'm seeing per minute, if we want to see per hour, uh, or if you want to see per day, right? So you can basically get different granularity and basically understand the whole system based on that. So I can just see last one day or last seven days, and, uh, and what we want to see per day or per hour, so it, it's basically, uh, uh, you can basically divide from that. And if you want to build your own small stuff, like, OK, items ordered as, as a table, or if you want to uh, create a, a pie chart of successful and delayed events, that can also be done. And if you want to export this information, like, for example, uh, here, so you can basically capture the current page, and you can create a report out of it. right? So this will basically uh, store, store the data. So you can basically see you know, whatever that's in the dashboard has been created as a report. Uh, likewise, you can even create different uh, sub-segment of these reports if you want to. And if it's really interested, you can even create a gadget uh, through this, like I can say a gadget called Foo, uh, and I'm going to use the database Siddhi data provider, um, and <coughs> here to do this particular use case, um, I may be using this is by location. So, uh, okay. So this is the uh, database and the table that I'm going to use, and what is the query that I want to run it run here? So I want to basically get a count of this stuff. So, so that is the query that I want. Oops. So this is the, the query that I want to run. If you want to give some permissions, you can get this username and do some manipulation. So you can only see your data, not others. So that kind of stuff is also possible. So go next. You, I want to create a pie chart out of it. The data field is total orders, pie chart, color category is location. Then if you do a preview, you can basically see, OK, from different locations, how you basically create a chart out of it. Or if you want to convert this into a bar chart, uh, then it becomes, you know, I want the x-axis should be location. I want a bar chart here, uh, the total fields, uh, and the number of items to be displayed. Uh, and then I show a preview. Now it basically goes show me a bar chart with the same information. So, I can basically create that. I can go to my design view, and I can go to the page. I can search for the foo. I can drag that and drop it. And I can go to the portal, and I can basically view the whole data. Right? So, so that's all for the demo of how do you collect data, you process it, and stuff. So now it's up to uh, uh, Nuan, so he will basically demonstrate how you can do the microservices or the uh, API management part of this solution. Thank you.
Can I have the screen, guys? Okay. Um, so uh, thanks, Suho. Um, so uh, what I'm basically going to uh, show you is basically um, um, how you can now add API management on, on top of these uh, scenarios that uh, Suho uh, showed you. So he basically so showed you a, a scenario of how you can you know, get orders and how those orders are processed internally, and then how you can retrieve those orders externally. Uh, so there was a lot of stuff that happened uh, uh, inside that particular system with regard to analyzing and running different kinds of rules on top of it. So my objective is to show you the basics of how you now expose these capabilities as managed APIs. So there, in this particular example, there, uh, there, there are basically two APIs. One API is for creating the orders, and the other API is for retrieving the uh, order information. So, uh, so all of these were built on the WSO2 stream processor, uh, and it had uh, a certain endpoints for getting order information and also for, uh, for creating order information and for retrieving order information. So what basically happened was that um, uh, <coughs> so Suho had uh, two endpoints. So uh, one is for like uh, entering order information. I call, I'll call it EO. Um, and there was another endpoint service, basically, which, which uh, he exposed so that we could retrieve all the information outside. So I'll call it RO. And uh, so I'm kind of running a similar simulation um, to, to, uh, to mock these two endpoints. And my scenario, the scenario that I'm going to show you is basically uh, how you can create this, uh, expose these as managed APIs. So this is running as on a separate uh, microservice or a service. So this is running on uh, port uh, 8006. And this one is running on port uh, 7443. Right? So now my objective is to get these two endpoints and convert them into uh, managed APIs. So just to show you. Uh, what these endpoints uh, look like. So um, I just show you, first of all, what, uh, how you can uh, enter order information directly to these uh, backends. So I have some uh, dummy, I have some curl commands pre-created. So this is basically uh, this particular curl command that I'm going to execute uh, right now. Okay. So this particular curl command I'm going to execute right now is, as you, if you notice, it's on. It's going to be for port 8006, the first uh, microservice. So if I execute this, you will see that it gives me a 200 OK uh, over here. So that's like I just entered some dummy order information. And then in the second one, uh, I'm using another curl command uh, that's on port uh, 7443. So this is the, that particular curl command. And if I hit that, you will see in here that you get some details uh, of some orders. So these are the two endpoints now I'm going to expose as managed services. So if you notice, you will see that both of these requests were post for, for post resources. Now, usually when you do a read, the rest recommendation is that you do it through a get. But our backend in this particular case is implemented in such a way that it is a post, and these are real world situations we have to deal with, right? Uh, so how do you go about doing this? Uh, so first of all, so the, uh, uh, my interest now is to create an API. And so this is the API publisher portal, the place where API developers would come in and create APIs. So I'm logged in as a user called John. So John is an API developer. He's a person creating an API interface. Uh, and I, by the way, just to give you an overview of the demo, what we are, so, uh, what I'm so, uh, planning to cover on is on basic, the basic uh, API design management uh, exposure, 
and how you can consume those APIs using the developer portal. And then after, after that, we'll run through the same exercise uh, using the uh, our micro gateway uh, technology. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, John's interest is to create a managed API. So he will go into this uh, section called go and create a new API. And as you can see, there are various options of creating APIs. Like if I have a Swagger file already, I can start from it. Uh, if this is a SOAP service, I can go in that path. And if I want to start fresh from uh, REST, I just go down that path. And that's the path that I'm going to choose here. So I say create uh, a new API and enter the name uh, of my API. So I'm going to name it as orders API and giving it a context called uh, shopping. And then you know uh, select some image so that this looks um, nice when you see it on the store. I can put a few tags. Uh, for grouping, right? And then the next is about defining the resource paths. So uh, like I said, so I, I want two resources for my API now. It's true that I have two backend systems, one for creating orders and one for uh, um, getting orders. But when you expose this as an API, it makes sense to expose this as one single API instead of two different endpoints, because that's the REST uh, recommendation. Uh, so this, this is one of the typical situations you end up with when you're doing microservice development, because your services are so fine-grained. Microservices are so fine-grained. You can't uh, uh, expose them as is to your consumers, because it's too complicated and too distributed. So for ease of consum consumption, you've got to follow the uh, REST standards. So uh, I want a resource called orders. And uh, the, this resource will support two methods one uh, a get and a post. Um, so I will add that particular resource, and I can do the documentation uh, of it here, saying that uh, simple things like this particular resource uh, produces JSON content, and uh, uh, this particular resource um, both accepts and produces uh, JSON content, so uh, things like that. So uh, I can do some small documentation then and there. So this is basically how I define my interface, and then I say save. <clears throat> so I have a very simple API definition now. And I go to the second step of creating my API, which is to define the backend URL. So I'm in the state where I have to def define, point my API to where my backend is. Now, the tricky situation here is that there is no single backend, but I now have two backends uh, to work with. So how do you deal with this situation? So generally, you would just enter the URL in this box here. But in, in this particular case, I don't. there are two end, uh, endpoints. And how do I uh, go about doing this? So to support these types of use cases, we have something called endpoint type. So the default endpoint type is REST. And we have something called SOAP, uh, obviously for proxying SOAP uh, services. And then there's something called a dynamic endpoint. So the dynamic endpoint is a scenario uh, is to be used in scenarios when you can't when you don't have a direct URL, but you have to programmatically decide in the runtime where to route your request to, based on uh, certain attributes. Uh, so in this particular case, I go with this option, and when you select this option, you are required to uh, provide a policy uh, so that the gateway can decide how to route the request to the particular backend. So. There are some, there are some pre-built policies. Uh, so these policies can be applied in different uh, paths, in different locations. One is during the request flow, during the response flow, and even when there's some kind of a fault happens, right? So in this particular case, I want to attach a policy to the request flow so that the gateway can decide where to route my request to. So there are some pre-built policies, like I said, but this is a special scenario. We obviously won't have a policy. Uh, for this particular uh, use case. So what I can do is I can define my own policy using the uh, policy uh, language, which is based on Apache Synapse. It's an XML-based language. And upload that policy to the inflow. I'll, I'll show you what this policy looks like. Uh, but for the moment, I'll just um, upload it first. Where is this one? OK. It is here. So I upload this policy. And if you want to take a look at what this policy looks like. So this is what it looks like. Uh, so this is an XML-driven policy. So we have something called a sequence, uh, which is basically a sequence of things to do. 
And on the top, you have uh, like two uh, properties. So the first property tells you that the backend system uh, needs uh, uh, to, to inject a header, uh, an authorization header to the request going out, because these, both these backends are protected using basic auth. And this is how I uh, put that header. And then um, the second part says uh, don't, so in the normal REST, when you're, uh, you, usually when you're proxying SOAP, uh, sorry, REST request, what you do is you uh, get the path parameter of your incoming request and append it to the uh, outgoing request. So in this particular case, I don't want to do that because there's no correlation between what I'm exposing to my clients versus what is there in the back end. They are completely different. So in this particular case, I'm going to get rid of that logic, and that's what the uh, second property does. And then we have something called a filter mediator. So what this basically does is check the incoming method of the request. And if it is a get method, then what it does is that, so it matches this particular section, the, this then section. It creates the necessary payload that is to be sent to the first microservice. Uh, and it creates the payload using this payload factory mediator. And, it set, uh, and after that, the property following that, we set the message type saying it's supposed to be a JSON. And then we change the method, HTTP method, to post, because this is a get incoming. So we have to change it to post when you're sending it out. So, um, <clears throat> and yeah, I, I almost forgot the most important thing. So the, this header mediator is the one that points to the relevant backend to route the request to. So this is how we uh, provide the backend URL in this particular case. Like This is one example of it. Uh, so that's what you do if it's a get. You route it to that particular endpoint, and then you provide the pay payload details in the middle. Uh, and if, it does, if, if it's a post, then you just simply route it to the uh, relevant endpoint on port uh, 8006. Uh, so that's what the policy looks like. So I upload this uh, uh, policy uh, over here, and then I uh, save the API. So as an API developer, my job is now done. I've uh, created the interface of the API and saved it. But my API is still not available for consumption because it's uh, not in a published state. So that is usually done by a separate role. So I will log out of John and log in as uh, someone called Smith. So Smith is a person having uh, the product manager role. So the product manager is a person who is generally supposed to publish APIs into the uh, API marketplace. So uh, the product manager logs in, and he's, uh, as you can see, the product manager does not have any option of changing the interfaces or the technical details of the API. So you can go into this section only of managing the API and uh, <coughs> define uh, lots of things. So I won't go into detail of all of these because it, it's uh, quite time consuming. So. Uh, so some of the things that he can do here are like uh, defining what, whether this is a default version or not, what transpose this needs to be exposed over, um, response caching, and the, the mandatory thing is deciding what business plans to attach to this particular API, what code has to attach. So that's what's mandated out of him. So he can select whatever the code has he prefers, and he has options of deciding which gateways to publish this API to. At the moment, I just have one, but you can have any number of gateways here. Uh, and provide some meta information just for visibility purposes. Uh, add some custom properties if he wants to. And then uh, save and publish the API. So there are lots of things in this form, uh, but we, we won't go into detail of all of it. Uh, but generally, what he, his job is to make sure that everything is according to the standard and select the proper policies or other quotas and publish the API. So now, when this API has been published, this is now ready for consumption. So in a couple of seconds, you should um, see this appear on the a application developer portal. So this is the API store now, what we call the app developer portal. Uh, and I'm not logged in as anyone. This is like the anonymous mode. And you see all the available APIs. And this is the API that we just uh, published to the uh, store. Uh, so we now have an API up and running. And now let's see what it takes to consume this API. So I'm not logged in yet, so I'll, 
I will log in as an application developer into the uh, developer portal. So I have an account already created. Uh, <clears throat> so I can browse through the APIs that I'm interested in, uh, go through its uh, documentation if there are any, uh, see the inline documentation if there are any uh, participate in forums and have a look at the API. And to consume this uh, API, I need an application. That's what I need to do. Uh, first of all, uh, if I'm interested in consuming this API. So I'll go into this section called Add Application and create my uh, application. So an application needs to have a name. And if you want to do a collaborative development of your application, you would enter the uh, groups uh, of which whom you want to share this application with. Uh, then this is basically a, a, a scenario or, or rather uh, a, a parameter which allows you to do fair usage policies. Um, so you can say by, uh, by this parameter how much a given, a single given user of your application is uh, given in terms of quotas for your application so that you ensure that the application quota is evenly distributed. Uh, and I'll talk about the token type. So an application can have uh, to, to one of two token types. It could be general OAuth tokens or self-contained uh, JWT tokens. Uh, in this case, I'm going to go with the default uh, general OAuth 2 token option. And later during the micro gateway demo, I'll show you the value, the usage of the JWT token. So I create an application by providing all of those information. And then I say, uh, ask the system to subscribe my application that I just created to this API. And when I'm subscribing, I'm basically creating a contract now uh, between this uh, <coughs> my application and, and, and the particular API. And I pick which, uh, which uh, business plan to subscribe with, and then I press the subscribe button. So now my application has a valid license to consume this particular API. And so by default, this API is secured using OAuth2. Uh, that's the default security model. So if, 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 you are, if you have an API that's secured with OAuth2, that means you need an OAuth token uh, to consume this API. So if you, to get an OAuth token, you need a valid OAuth application in the first place. So we created the representation of an application just now. And now what we are about to do is to get a pair of OAuth keys for my application. And this is uh, how you do it. So in here, we have <coughs> uh, a, a UI which allows you to generate keys for your application. So when generating keys, you can say what are the grant types my application should support. So grant types come into the picture based on the nature of your application. Like uh, different grant types have different protocols for uh, getting tokens. Uh, so you can select the appropriate grant types and then press on this button called Generate Keys. So once you press this button, your application now has a valid consumer key and a consumer secret. So these are the OAuth uh, keys uh, that represent your application. This is like the application's username and password. You can think of these two attributes as apps, username and password. So the consumer key is the username, and the consumer key secret is like the password. What that means is that you should never say, share your consumer secret with anyone. The application's consumer secret is, a, uh, is meant to be private, but the consumer key is fine. Yeah, you can share it. So, okay, so now my application has a consumer key and a consumer secret. And now, how does a user who is using this application get an access token? So imagine you're developing a mobile application to access this orders API. You've developed your app, you've distributed it across your user base, and now how does a user uh, use this app to get a token. Uh, and that is through one of these grant types. And we have something called a password grant. Uh, uh, this particular tooltip here shows you how to get a token using that particular password grant. So a password grant uh, basically accepts a user's username and a password as input. And it accepts a base64 encoded version of this consumer key and consumer secret, uh, basically a, a basic auth header. And then after validating all of that information, it issues an access token to the particular user 
via this uh, uh, on behalf of this application. So uh, that is what we are going to do. So I've logged in into this developer portal using an account called Nuan. And now I am going to uh, uh, get a token for my application using a, an end user's credential. So the end user end user's name is uh, Steve. So first of all, I'll just uh, copy this uh, basic auth header into this. Uh, and I'm going to issue a curl command uh, to get an access token now. So what I am simulating here is a typical login process of an end user to an application. So if you are developing an application, uh, what you have to do is to have a form which accepts the user's username and password, and then use that information to make an HTTP request to this endpoint and get a token. So if I execute this request, you should now see uh, that I successfully uh, got an access token. Uh, so I can now use this access token to, uh, um, to basically access my or consume my API. So the developer portal itself has an inbuilt uh, API test client, so I'm going to use that. So, so one more thing I forgot to mention is that in here, um, so you also, when you press this button to generate keys, uh, if you notice, there is also an access token that's given to you on the UI itself. But this is a test access token for the purpose of testing the APIs. The reason I did not use this access token is because that's not the real world scenario. Uh, this is like for the developer's convenience to quickly get an access token and test it out. The, the proper real world use case is that you go through the proper grant type and get an access token for your application using the uh, recommended um, APIs. So um, I'm going to use this test client it's called the API console, and use my access token uh, to access this API. So the token that you saw on the UI is auto-populated here, so I'm just going to get rid of that and paste the access token that I got uh, <coughs> uh, from, from the token API, and uh, going to see if I can access this API now. So I'll just try it out. So as you can see, I get a 200 OK. Uh, with, with the uh, particular data. So that is basically how you access, uh, uh, access an API through the API gateway. So what happened here was, in case uh, you didn't understand, so we deployed an API gateway uh, in front of both these microservices. And so we got a client uh, who was using an application this client sent an HTTP request to the API gateway, so I'll call this G, API gateway, right? And this guy sent the access token in the request, and the gateway validated the particular access token. So in this particular case, we are using a full-fledged API manager here, not just a gateway. Uh, uh, but in a typical deployment, you may have deployed the key manager separately. So if that was the case, he would talk to him to validate the token. And after the token is valid, it then evaluated a policy to see if the request for a get toss or a post. And depending on that, routed the request to the uh, relevant backend systems. So that's what just happened uh, when we uh, did all of these things. Now, this is a single API that is exposing two different backend systems. Uh, so in general, that's the general, most general and simplified use, end-to-end uh, -end use of a uh, very simple API management use case. So now imagine, so this is a single gateway scenario. So you can have any number of APIs on this gateway for any number of services. But when dealing with microservice and microservice environments, uh, having too many services APIs on here is a problem for scalability, problem for manageability. Uh, so imagine you are getting a, a huge number of requests for your uh, read API and less number of requests for your uh, write API, right? Uh, I'm not sure whether that's a correct order. Anyway, so um, now if you want to scale this now, just because you're getting huge number of requests here, you have to scale the entire gateway, right, which is an overhead. So that is where uh, micro gateways come into the picture. So with micro gateways, you can have independent gateways per each service and scale the micro gateway part 
the relevant micro gateway only, without having to worry about the rest of the system. So now I'll show you how you can uh, develop, use the WSO2 API micro gateway uh, uh, to proxy a request to your uh, backend systems. <clears throat> so the micro gateway comes in the form of a comes in the form of a, 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 a toolkit in the sense that uh, what you have to do is you uh, build, you compile and run the micro gateway binary. So first of all, <clears throat> what you need to do is uh, you need to have an API defined in your API management system uh, that is proxying the relevant backend you want. So in my case, I have this API called get order. Uh, OK, let me log out of Smith and log in with John to show you that information. So this get order API is, um, is proxying this uh, relevant backend uh, on uh, 7443, the one below uh, uh, there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a micro gateway for this uh, particular API. So how you create a micro gateway is by executing a, a command on the command line. And so and the command goes like this. It's goes a micro gateway setup. And you need to provide, by the way, is this visible? The back? OK. And you need to uh, give a name for your micro gateway project here. And the name, I'll call it as um, get orders. That's the name of my project. And I, I have to say what API I am interested in um, creating here. So in this case, the name of my API is get order. And I have to specify the version of the API. And the version of the API is 100. Uh, so that's basically it. Uh, and now I execute this command. And what happens is that this client now connects to my API manager system and tries to download the definition of the API. So it's asking for my credential. So I'll give the credential for John. And so uh, what just happened was that the, the micro gateway client connected to the API manager system, downloaded the API definition, and created the source code of my micro gateway as a project. Uh, now the next step is to build this, right? So the source code is auto-generated. And the uh, next step is to build it. And the command to do that is to say micro gateway build and specify the name of your project. Uh, so I give that name. And what happens is it now compiles the source and uh, creates the binary. <clears throat> so the build is uh, successful. So if I now go into my project directory in the target, I should see this uh, zip file. So in this case, I'm just creating a micro gateway virtual machine. Uh, no Docker, no Kubernetes, nothing. Uh, so I can just unzip this and then run this particular micro gateway. So I go into the bin directory, and there's a shell script which I can start. So before starting this, there is one thing to uh, highlight here, and that is uh, this endpoint that I'm talking to is secured. It, uh, it needs a basic auth header. So we have security from here to here in the form of OAuth. And from here to here, it needs an OAuth header, like you saw in the policy. So when starting the micro gateway, I have to inform the micro gateway what is the uh, credential that I need to send to my backend. So I've given this information in the UI. So uh, if you go through the UI, uh, <coughs> you will see that I have specified that this is a protected backend and the credentials are admin and admin. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, the micro gateway, uh, uh, during the startup, I have to provide the password for the micro gateway. And the username, it uh, basically knows. So the way to do that is, um, is here, where is the, uh, yeah. So, so what I'll do is I'll start the micro gateway, and uh, the command basically is to do a bash gateway, and you provide the password as an environment uh, variable. So there are various options to do this, and this is one. Uh, so you give the name of the uh, particular backend in this form, and you press uh, Enter. So now I have the micro gateway up and running. So as you can see, it boots up uh, pretty fast. 
so now I have a running gateway for my backend system. Next is how do I send a request to this? Uh, <clears throat> so this is where uh, this concept of um, JWT tokens or self-contained tokens comes into play. So uh, last time I just created a new application called Shopping Cart, which the token type as OAuth, and I also have another application called JWT App, and its token type is a JSON Web Token or JWT. So what that means is that when I go into this section and press the button uh, to uh, generate a key for me, the key that it generates is actually a JWT. So if you inspect this J JWT uh, through uh, JWT.io, let's just see what it looks like. So I just copied it and enter. <clears throat> so as you can see, this token is a self-contained token. It's not a random string. It has some information such as who is the subject, basically who is the owner of the token, uh, uh, and what is the tier belonging to the application, uh, what is the issuer, who are the issuers, right? Uh, what are the subscribed APIs to this application, likewise. And, and the most important thing is, at the bottom you won't see it here, is that is the signature of the JWT. So the JWT is a, a three-part string. And the final part of it is a signature. So the signature is used to verify the authenticity of the person or the entity that issued this particular access token. So I now have a valid access token in the form of a JWT uh, that I can use to access my um, uh, to access my micro gateway. So let me uh, paste this uh, token over here. So I'll do it, and then I'll basically, so as you can see, this token is pretty long, since it's a JWT. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll paste this over here. So yeah, as you can see, in here I'm sending this request to HTTP localhost 9090. That's the, that's the host of my uh, micro gateway uh, with the relevant payload. <clears throat> so. As you can see, uh, the, the request went through the gateway, and the gateway, micro gateway proxied it through to my uh, backend, and I get the response from the backend. Now, the special thing about here is that um, so we had a micro, we just deployed a micro gateway over here, right? Uh, micro gateway over here, and we also had an API manager system running, and when the client uh, sent the request to the micro gateway. The micro gateway did not have to contact anyone else for validating the token. That's because the token that is sent was self-contained. It, well, it verified the signature of the JWT just to make sure uh, that it was issued by a trusted authority and then proxied the request uh, through to the backend system. So the, this is an important fact to keep in mind because this makes it very much easy to scale the micro gateway because it has no connections to any other systems, uh, the, any other components in the system. Um, so that's basically the, the micro gateway VM mode, basically how you uh, get a micro gateway virtual machine. Though, so the same process can be applied if you want to uh, create a Docker image of the micro gateway. Uh, so I, I'll show you that too. It's, uh, it's inbuilt in the sense that uh, you don't have to go through any manual processes to uh, create the Docker image. So I'll show you how to, get, uh, 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 how to create a Docker image out of this. So uh, first of all, I I'd like to show you this file called uh, getorders.toml. So this is a configuration file. Uh, it's a YAML-like, but not so YAML uh, config file. It's called toml. And it has information such as what is the name of the Docker image, uh, what is the tag you want the Docker image to have, and what is the, the host of your Docker registry. And there are, there's something uh, related to copying uh, configuration files, and the, that's the information you see right at the bottom. Uh, so we need to specify this config file to our, uh, we, sh we need to input this config file to our build command in order to create a Docker. Uh, Docker image. So how to do that is um, similar to before. So we say micro gateway setup. Oops. 
micro dash gateway setup, and we give the name of the project. So I'll call this orders uh, Docker. I'll give a new project name and say the name, specify the name of my API, the version, and specify this file through a minus D parameter. So it will be get orders dot Thomas. So this is the setup command. Uh, and I say set up my micro gateway as a, oops, <clears throat> as a Docker image. So uh, I issue this command, and it asks me for the credential of John to download the API definition. And now the project is uh, set up. In the sense, the source code is generated. And the next step is to do a micro gateway build on, on the, um, orders Docker project. So I do a build now. So it starts compiling the source. <coughs> and it starts creating the uh, Docker image uh, then and there as well. <coughs> so the, the, the build is successful. So I don't have any Docker processes running. But uh, if I now do a Docker image LS on my Docker registry, uh, you will see that I have a a Docker image right on the top called um, get orders created uh, 15 seconds ago. Uh, so that's how you can generate a Docker image of your uh, micro gateway. And the next step is uh, obviously to run uh, the micro gateway. And for that, you can uh, use the default, like the uh, general uh, commands for running a Docker image. And one important thing here again is that, so similar to us giving the the credential of the backend when we use the VM version, we have to follow the same principle here as well. Basically, give the uh, credential of your backend system as an environment variable to the uh, Docker run command. So that's what I've done uh, here in the beginning. So these uh, environment variables uh, play an important role in the micro gateway. So this is used for things like the backend credentials and even the endpoint URL. So after you build a micro gateway image or a VM, uh, if you are to move that image to another environment, like from your development to your staging environment, then you, are, you have to reprogram your backend URL. And in the case of Docker images and stuff, you can't rebuild the image after you build it once uh, when you're moving it to other environments. So it's important that you pro can provide these uh, backend URLs through variables. So that's what we've done. So let's just see whether this starts up. And yes, it does. So if I now issue a Docker PS, you will see that, uh, yeah, there's a micro gateway Docker image um, uh, just started. So that's basically how you uh, create a Docker image. And the same uh, is, um, can be applied for Kubernetes artifacts as well. So we support Kubernetes out of the box. So similar to the config file you saw uh, for the Docker image, we have a similar config file for Kubernetes environment. So if you do a build through with those particular settings, you will get all the Kubernetes uh, artifacts created, just like the Docker image was created. And then what you have to do is uh, do a kubectl uh, apply <coughs> to deploy those artifacts on your uh, Kubernetes uh, or OpenShift environments. So that's uh, fundamentally how you uh, generate and use a micro gateway. So this, uh, it's dis the gateway distribution size is about uh, 40 megabytes. And it uh, starts up in about one second. Uh, and yeah, it, it uses uh, 200, uh, less than 256 uh, MB of memory. And we just, the scenario we, I just showed you was a scenario for just one API. Uh, so that's the general recommendation in microservice architectures. But technically, it is also possible to combine more than one API through a concept called labels. So we have a mechanism of labeling APIs, which, which needs to be grouped together. And then when generating the micro gateway, what you provide as input to the setup command is not the name of the API, but the name of the label. And when you do that, it generates a micro gateway with all the APIs that have the same label attached. So uh, that basically concludes our, our, our session. I hope it had been a fruitful one. Uh, we are out of time. Are we out of time? Okay. All right, thanks, guys.